why don't we start with the, I have a series of prayers to start with. The first is James Wright's poem, Lying in a Hammock at William Duffy's Farm in Pine Island, Minnesota. Uh, William Duffy was a poet himself and a leader of poets, and he had a farm in Minnesota, and James Wright had gone out to see him. And uh, so this poem goes, Over my head I see the bronze butterfly asleep on the black trunk, blowing like a leaf in green shadow. Down the ravine behind the empty house, the cowbells follow one another into the distances of the afternoon. To my right, in a field of sunlight between two pines, the droppings of last year's horses blaze up into golden stones. I lean back as the evening darkens and comes on. A chicken hawk floats over, looking for home. I have wasted my life. But is this the... Oh, shut up. <laughs> Um, so the first question I have is, in that last phrase, I have wasted my life, is he bewailing his life or is he boasting? It's not as obvious as you would think, and it goes right to the heart of what I want to talk about today, about freedom. Um, I'll read it again. Can we just tell him to be a little quieter? Bit? Is it? Okay. I'm going to read it again because it's, now you'll be able to hear it. Over my head I see the bronze butterfly asleep on, a, on the black trunk blowing like a leaf in green shadow. Down the ravine behind the empty house the cowbells follow one another into the distances of the afternoon. You notice, by the way, he's in a hammock. He doesn't see the cows. He hears the cowbells following one another. To my right, in a field of sunlight between two pines, the droppings of last year's horses blaze up into golden stones. The droppings of last year's horses is the waste, horseshit, and it blazes into gold. I lean back as the evening darkens and comes on. A chicken hawk, I like that by the way, a chicken hawk floats over. Look what's happening, there's some three words. A chicken because a hawk becomes a, under, now you're underwater. Folks, over looking for home, I have wasted my life. And I think, frankly, that the, that thing about the horse's droppings becoming golden stones puts wasting your life in a whole different context. Yes, he on the one hand has, has uh, wasted his life writing poetry as opposed to being industrious. On the other hand, he has wasted his life. Uh, good for him. Uh, so that even something so tight as that is, is drafty with possible meaning. The other poem I wanted to read, and then I'm going to show you a, a picture, but the other poem is, is very famous, uh, Elizabeth Bishop's poem, The Fish. I caught a tremendous fish and held him beside the boat half out of water with my hook fast in a corner of his mouth. He didn't fight. He hadn't fought at all. He hung a grunting weight, battered and venerable and homely. Here and there his brown skin hung in strips like ancient wallpaper, and its pattern of darker brown was like wallpaper. Shapes like full-blown roses stained and lost through age. He was speckled with barnacles, fine rosettes of lime, and infested with tiny white sea lice, and underneath two or three rags of green weed hung down, while his gills were breathing in the terrible oxygen, the frightening gills fresh and crisp with blood that can cut so badly. I thought of the coarse white flesh packed in like feathers, the big bones and the little bones, the dramatic reds and blacks of his shiny entrails, and the pink swim bladder like a big panty. I looked into his eyes, which were far larger than mine, 
but shallower and yellowed. The irises backed and packed with tarnished tinfoil seen through the lenses of, the, of an old scratched Isinglass. They shifted a little, but not to return my stare. It was more like the tipping of an object toward the light. I admired his sullen face, the mechanism of his jaw, and then I saw that from his lower lip, if you could call it a lip, grim, wet, and weapon-like, hung five old pieces of fish line, or four and a wire leader, with a swivel still attached, with all their five big hooks grown firmly into his mouth, a green line frayed at the end where he broke it, two heavier lines and a fine black thread still crimped from the strain and snap when it broke and he got away. Like metals with their ribbons frayed and wavering, a five-haired beard of wisdom trailing from his aching jaw. I stared and stared and victory filled up the little rented boat from the pool of bilge where oil had rusted, had spread a rainbow around the rusted engine to the baler rusted, th uh, the baler rusted orange. The sun cracked thwarts, the oarlocks on their strings, the gunnels until everything, everything was rainbow, rainbow, rainbow. And I let the fish go. Um, without saying too much about that, I want to go directly to talking about a painting. Um, and today I will, I want these back, but pass those mm -hmm. out. This is a painting by Adolf Menzel. Great, great uh, Prussian painter, um, late 19th century. There are basically three great realist painters around this time. There's Courbet in France, there's Aikens in the United States, and there's Adolf Menzel in, in, um, in Prussia. He parenthetically is dwarfishly small. Um, and um, that will become pertinent in a second. And he does a lot of history paintings. And in this painting, he's doing uh, Frederick the Great, uh, Frederick the Second, when he was still a prince before he becomes a king, going to examine the work of Pesne, the artist, who was doing effectively the gazebo, or what do they call it? Uh, um, the God, there's all the different words here, but but it, it's basically the the, the 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 gazebo in the back of the palace, the the Frederick the Great's version of Versailles, and the guy is painting, Pesne is painting up above, and you guys have the postcard in your hands, and I'd ask you for a start, how many people are in this picture? <laughs> Five, six, seven, eight. Well, one of the things that's really cool about it, by the way, is you can feel the airiness there, and you see people coming in. So you can see that there is, uh, there's this guy here, and there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. What about all those things up there? Why do you count those as people and not those? They're all painted. Uh, in any case, what's fascinating is that you have this sense of, of uh, a, almost like a wound spring. Um, they are coming up the stairs to go see what's going on, and there's been some noise. There's been a ruckus up there, right? We'll come back to that in a second. Instead of having a, 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 a boom box, he has his violinist there. That's what they had, what passed for boom boxes in those days. This guy here is mixing the paints, right? Uh, you'll notice, by the way, the chair here, which is a low chair with a little bit of wine, and that is the chair that, that the artist himself would have sat in, a, a low chair, because he himself is very small. But in any case, this whole thing, there's a general kind of, of movement that, of like the spring here that comes up the arm here of the mannequin, by the way. 
So you could imagine it kind of going like this and like this. Um, but there's a problem up here. Something, some hanky panky is going on up here, some funny business. And uh, there's, a, in fact, a clatter, a noise, which is a, apparently what the king is looking up at, or the prince. Uh, and look what's happening here. She's knocked over, in running away from the painter, she's knocked over this, uh, the paints, uh, the paintbrushes, which are about to come clattering down, right? This, this thing is structured within an inch of its life. It's almost, you know, it's like wound incredibly tight at the last possible moment before total chaos breaks out. It will, when that hits there, it's going to, for one thing, splatter all over the prints. It's going it's to be complete chaos in, in just a second. But this is the last possible second beforehand. And it is precisely the incredible sense of form, which we've been talking about for the last two weeks, that is about to break into the chaos of freedom that we'll be talking about today. Um, another way of putting it is he describes, he describes, he describes, and then he lets it go. Well, in this case, to let it go means to let it, let it rip. And that's about to, what's about to happen here. All of which is, is in some ways uh, a backdrop to what I want to talk about today. Um, up till now, we've been talking, to review the bidding, we, we've been talking about, um, about the paradox of form, which is to say that as we all know, everything that happens is complete chaos, um, contingency upon contingency. Uh, who knows why any, it's mad, if you, if you really stop to think about it, it will drive you insane. And certainly as a reader, you don't want to read that. You don't want to read that truth that it's all complete contingency. Um, so in fact, the job of the, of the narrative nonfiction writer is to ascribe all the reasons it happened the way it happened to give it to give it form uh, which I hope you'll agree by now uh, having been with the last two classes is, is a kind of fiction it's making up a form which is provisional it's good enough for right now but it's not true in an absolute sense what's really true is it's all chaos but today I want to flip the things a little bit and to talk about the way that that um, it is also true that everything that happens happens exactly the way it had to happen, or it would have happened some other way. And part of the job of the narrative nonfiction of the writer, or the reporter, or the chronicler is to worry out all the reasons it happened that way. But having said that, it is equally true that if you're talking about human beings, everybody involved uh, was at the, as it was happening, was free to act in any other way. That is as much of a fact as all the other facts are gonna marshal to explain what happened. And a great challenge is, a, is to figure out a way to keep that fact alive as well, to keep the radical human freedom of all the actors alive as a fact, despite the fact that once it happened, it happened exactly the way it had to happen. Um, so that's kind of what I hope the reading will be getting to today. And with that in mind, uh, why don't we start by turning to the Grace Paley story. Um, how many of you know Grace Paley, the writer Grace Paley? Uh, she's a wonderful, was a wonderful, wonderful writer. And this is from a book of hers with one of the great titles, Enormous Changes at the Last Minute. Um, and uh, I should have brought you the, the first page of the book which says that every character in this book is fictional except for the father. In every story he appears and he is my father. Uh, Dr. Ivan Goodside, I think his name is. Uh, and so here we have a story of a conversation with her father. Um, does anybody want to give me a two sentence summary of what, what is this story about? You're all going to have to try harder today because there's not that many of you. Yeah. <laughs> it's about a woman who's talking to her older, ill father, and she tells her how he is still alive. And she tells him a story, and he wants her to tell it better. 
and they have, it's about a woman who's talking to her father, not just ill, I mean, it, the subtext is he's on his deathbed, right? Uh, and he says, you know, come on, tell me a story, the way you used to write stories, the good old fashioned story. You, you've gotten such these, these weird stories, why can't you write a good old story the way you used to? And then they have an argument, right? And it's a fundamental argument uh, uh, around these stories. Well, well, we'll work it out as we get there, but so exactly. I mean, so, so it starts out that her father is 86 years old, and he says, I'd like you to write a simple story just one more time. Just recognizable people, and then write down what happened to them next. And I say, yes, why not? That's possible. I want to please him, though I don't remember what writing that way. I would like to tell such a story if he means the kind that begins, there was a woman, followed by the plot, the absolute line between two points, which I've always despised. Not for literary reasons, but because it takes all hope away. Everyone, real or invented, deserves the open destiny of life. So that's, by the way, one of the things you take out. Everyone, real or invented, deserves the open destiny of life. You type that out, you put that above your computer, you bow down to it every morning before you turn on the computer. You remember it over and over again. Um, by the way, what does just the word destiny come from? Does anybody know the origin of that word? This is pathetic. But... Is there anything here that works? Let's see. <laughs> It's, anyway, it, it comes from des. Oh, that's pathetic. It comes from des terminus. The end. One's destiny is one's end. And she says everybody deserves the open destiny of life, which is to say the open endedness of it. You will know what your destiny is when you get to the end of your story. That will have been your destiny. Uh, and she's talking about how that needs to be open. Finally, she thinks of a story that had been happening a couple of years, for a couple of years, right across the street. By the way, things don't happen across the street. Stories happen across the street. We don't experience things. We experience stories. We put constructions on them. It's the same thing I was telling you the other day. I don't ask you what was it. I ask you what was it like. Uh, you don't want the, the full transcript. You don't want the, you know, 24 hours of my life in a place reporting and I can tell you every single thing. You just want to know what it was like. Uh, in the same way, what you want is, tell me the story. You were just in Yugoslavia, tell me. What's it like there? What's the, st what's the story there, anyway? Um, and in this case, so she proceeds to tell a story. By the way, what's the, what's the story? If you were to give a sentence of the story, what's the story that she tells? It doesn't have to be you. It would be you. stuck, yeah. So now think about what's happening here. This is a daughter having an argument with her father, and in this illustration she tells a story that, that had been happening across the street about a mother and her son. And, uh, and indeed, the mother, she t it's basically a, a straightforward story. She's trying to bond with him. She gets into drugs just like him. He gets out of drugs. <laughs> he refuses to see her anymore because she won't get out of drugs herself. And the father at that point, you know, says, uh, you know, well, uh, okay, Pa, that's it. And, well, I see what you mean. You misunderstood me on purpose, he said. Uh, you know there's a lot more to it than that, you know. Uh, and then they get into a conversation and, and um, okay, okay yourself. But listen, I believe that she's good looking, but I don't think she was so smart. That's true, I said. Actually, ah, thank you. <laughs> that's true, I said. Actually, that's the trouble with stories. People start out fantastic. You think they're extraordinary, but it turns out, as the work goes along, they're just average with a good education. Sometimes the other way around, the person's a kind of dumb innocent, but he outwits you, and you can't even think of an ending good enough, a destiny good enough. Um, and, and he said, well, try, you know, as it happens, I'm not going anywhere, try again. So now she writes the story a second time. By the way, gorgeous writer. I mean, these, this, both of these stories are wonderful. The second, you can't imagine them, you could do a better story than the first one. The second one is even more wonderful. Um, 
and um, afterwards, uh, you know, my baby and burst into terrible, face-scarring, time-consuming tears, the end. Destiny, the end. First, my father was silent, and then he said, number one, you have a nice sense of humor. Number two, I see you can't tell a plain story, so don't waste time. Number three, I suppose that means she was alone, she was left like that, his mother alone, possibly sick. I said, yes. Poor woman, poor girl to be born in a time of fools, to live among fools, the end, the end, you are right to put that down, the end. I didn't want to argue, but I had to say, well, it's not necessarily the end, Pa. Uh, and then they have, and this is what I wanted to bring out when you're, with your summary of it, they have a really serious argument about whether things just end. Whether you're, when are you going to face it? Things just end, is what he wants to say. And this is a rather heavy argument for a man on his deathbed to be having with the daughter who is insisting, no, no, it doesn't end. And he's saying, damn it, when are you going to grow up and face it? This is how it is. It's just terrible. Life is horrible. It's the end. Uh, tragedy, plain tragedy, historical tragedy, no hope, the end. Oh, pa, she could change. No. I had promised the family to always let him have the last word, the last word when arguing. But in this case, I had a different responsibility. That woman lives across the street. She's my knowledge and my invention. Which, by the way, that, you can take that sentence and also put it up on your computer. That's what nonfiction writing is. She's my knowledge and my invention. I'm sorry for her. I'm not going to leave her like that in the house crying. Actually, neither would life, which unlike me, has no pity. So she changes. No, it's OK. She starts to work at the clinic. She's really popular at the clinic and so forth. And then they have this incredible thing where, where uh, no, he said, truth first. She will slide back. A person must have character. A person must be a character, must have character. She does not. No, Pa, he said, that's it. She's got a job. Forget it. She's in that storefront working. How long will it be, he asked. Tragedy, you too. When will you look it in the face? End of the story, written by a daughter about her father, who presumably has in the meantime died, but who actually hasn't died. He's quite alive in this story. Um, that begins to give a sense of kind of the, what I'm trying to get at today, is, is the open-endedness of everything, no matter, even when it's a story that you think you know what's happened, even just the interpretation, let alone the self-interpretation, is constantly open-ended. No matter what's happened, you can always find another way of putting a construction on it. Uh, and even while it was happening, it could have happened some other way. Um, we've got a lot to get through here, so I'll go directly to the next story, um, which was that one uh, that Ellen Paul wrote about this artist, Vincent Desiderio. Um, by the way, I, I brought here, at the break, you can come take a look at some of the works, because it's very hard to see it on here, but in, in color. Um, these paintings that, uh, you know, of, of the boy uh, with his apparatus. Um, Fairly harrowing paintings. Um, yeah, and then this one here. What did you make of this story? movie. It, 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 it is extremely annoying. Uh, do you think the author, Alan Paul, is, as, is aware of how annoying it is? I, as soon as she got that quote in, it unlocked it. And I realized that she's, of course, aware of it. She, I mean, the reason you're feeling this is she's making you feel it. She's playing you like a piano. My first reaction was, you know, she, does she think this is smart? 
So is she going along with this and so forth? And it's very smart the way she did it, by the way. Uh, All the bullshit. This is, what, what do we find so annoying? Well, to summarize the story, I mean, this is a story about a, a couple who was visited with the absolute worst nightmare you can imagine. Uh, and the husband happens to be a painter. The nightmare being, of course, the, the events of a single night where his child is a terrible malpractice takes place at the hospital and the child is left permanently damaged, brain damaged. Um, but the but what I, I, I don't, tell me if I'm putting words in your mouth. But his insistence, he starts painting all these paintings that seem to be about his biographical situation. But when asked what they're about, he says it's about abstract expressionism and it's confounding relationship to the Lacanian philosophy. He, he's filled with verbiage. He's continually, he, at one point, it's described as a whirring saw blade, you know, just kind of incredible verbiage, and you just want to say. No, that's not what it's about. It's about your son. And, he, and it, the son, his son is the last thing he'll talk about, or his marriage, or any of these things. He is, he's filled with intellectual blather that's just coming out. And uh, is that what you found annoying? Uh, you, you didn't find it annoying, or you just? I mean, I guess I looked at the picture of him, like, uh, I, had, I for it because I, like, I saw that as a picture. So, so you're seeing it as, as a protective projection it's the yeah, way he deals know, with it. He, like it I mean, most artists do that, where they are really, especially ones that are really autobiographical, they tend to then claim that it has nothing to do with them. Right. And if you know them at all, you know it's like, there's so much to it, but I, but I feel like it's so legitimate. I, we should mention that you're an actress, so you're, you're dealing with that all the time in plays with, with living actors who claim it has nothing to do with them personally. I, by the way, did a profile some years ago, which is pertinent right now, uh, of Roman Polanski, uh, which is in my ver book Vermeer in Bosnia, but, but uh, he is the most shatteringly autobiographical filmmaker. Uh, he's not only autobiographical looking back, he's constantly predicting what's about to happen to him, but then does happen to him. Uh, and, but if you press him, he says, oh, no, no, it's, oh, no, no, nothing to do with me, nothing to do with me. And, and, uh, and so it is true that, that artists are like that. Having said this, I think this is a fairly extreme version of it. Yeah? I, it didn't bother me because I never got to see that Paul bought it. Right. So the fact that the author, Alan Paul, doesn't buy it helps you not to buy it. Right. And, and, um, what I would describe, one of the things that's happening here is that the guy is in an analogical delirium. His grief takes the form of relentlessly analogizing everything. Oh, well, these bars must be, you know, Barnett Newman's bars. This is, you know, Lacan said this. And, and I find that Derrida said, well, he, he, he's endlessly analogizing and not confronting what's right in front of him. And that brings up, I want to start with it here, but we'll take it through the next few pieces as well some incredibly valuable stuff from Sartre, Jean-Paul Sartre, um, in Being and Nothingness. And, uh, and it's in the pack, it, it's in the readings. You can go look at them tomorrow. I mean, uh, they'll be posted. It, being and Nothingness is a book that, did we talk about this already? Uh, I was talking about it with somebody the other day. Sartre writes Being and Nothingness in the middle of occupied Paris, by the way on an insane amphetamine rush. I mean, he's in a frenzy. He's on, on amphetamine on speed the entire time. He's sitting at a cafe. He writes this thing, which is one of the great, great pieces of philosophy, uh, two-thirds of which is incomprehensible. It is such bullshit. It is so convoluted and so maddening. Uh, Oliver Sacks, his copy, uh, ra usually you know how you underline the parts you like? Oliver Sacks with a thick black marker has gone through and just like the FBI has just <laughs> blotted out page after page, line after line, and then just leaves these passages of cerulean clarity. Uh, and then he blots out some more. But at one point, Sartre, I mean, the key to, to the being a nothingness is that Sartre is trying to understand bad faith. Um, he's in effect doing a critique in much the way that Kant did a critique of pure reason to understand what must reason, what must human life be like if this is what reason is like, you know, and, and he does a critique, a study to figure it out. 
And in Sartre's case, he's doing, um, he essentially, the, and it's about page 90 or somewhere in there, maybe 100, uh, and he starts talking about bad faith and about human, what must human nature be like such that bad faith is possible. And it starts out as a critique of Freud, Freud's notion of the unconscious, that, oh, there were all these unconscious reasons why somebody did something. There are all these unconscious drives. And they are repressed, and there's a censor that keeps, them, keeps you from knowing about them. And Sartre asks the wonderful question. He says, well, wait a second. Is the censor on the conscious side or the unconscious side? Clearly, the censor has to be on the conscious side of things to be able to be a good censor. Otherwise, the stuff would slip through. And in fact, the censor is it's the most conscious thing about us. It is the thing that is keeping us continually from not thinking the deep thoughts in the mode of not thinking them. In other words, you want to sleep with your mother or something. It's just like, is, is just this incredible, it may or may not be the thing that's driving you, but it's not driving you unconsciously. You are thinking it, about it relentlessly in the mode of making sure not to think about it. And he says, this is what, what I mean by bad faith. And then he proceeds to have a section called Patterns of Bad Faith, where he has one incredibly clear and wonderful description after another of human behavior. Every single one of them nowadays, totally politically incorrect. Notwithstanding they're true, but, but they are politically incorrect. You may have to deal with the genders and so forth as you hear these stories. And the first one he tells, he says, what do I mean by bad faith? And he says, well, let's think about the situation of, the, of a girl on a date. I think, I think he even calls it a girl. So you were, no, right from the beginning, we're in bad shape. Um, and the, even, she, she both wants to be addressed as a sexual person and not addressed as a sexual person. She she's, wants both things at the same time. And, and uh, so they're, they've gone to the movie, and now they're out on the sand, and they're sitting at a bench, and they're looking at the, uh, at the thing. And at, at that point, the man puts his hand on her thigh. And Sartre does a wonderful description that if she pushes the hand away, the evening's going to go one way, and if she leaves it there, it's going to go another way. You know, and, but she's torn, she's conflicted about what she wants to do. And he then says, we all know what happens next. She leaves the hand there, but she doesn't notice that she's left it there because at that moment she's talking about fate, the stars, the sand, the river of time. Her mind is elsewhere, it's filled with big thoughts, and she just doesn't know that the hand is there. And the evening will take its form from there and will end up where it's going to end up. And in the morning she can say, I don't know what got into me. I, I, you know, how did this happen? I, I wasn't there. What was going on? This, you know, and she'll be able to deny responsibility. If it bothers you, just flip the genders. It's, it's, it's as true. This is, this is dating reality 101. And so, this is dating reality one. Uh, but um, so he goes on to describe that situation and then comes up with this fantastic sentence, which drives people crazy, but which is when you unpack it, really wonderful. Man is that being who is what he is not and is not what he is. In other words, we are both flesh and transcendence. We are both our bodily selves, and we are trying to be more than our bodily selves. And to the extent that we try to be only more than our bodily selves, or only our body, we are in bad faith. You know, but we're continually ricocheting back and forth. And bad faith isn't even bad. It's just what human nature is, and that's what he's trying to get at. Um, and another way of putting it, by the way, is being and nothingness. Nothingness is human existence. Being is the being of this table, the being of that chair, the being of, of well, this one's even deader than dead, but, uh, but this is, it, that's being. That's what the world is like. Human being, by contrast, or consciousness, is endlessly aspiring to get to this state and falling flat, not getting there, not being able to be there. It is not what it is and is what it is not. It is nothingness. So anyway, he goes on like that for a while. And then he has a few other examples that are very good. And then, uh, then he does the next example, which is also totally uh, politically incorrect that he tells the story about the homosexual and his friend. Now, by the way, you can see how the bearing of the first story I just told to, 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 uh, to uh, Vincent Desiderio's situation. Instead of you know, just admitting that he's drawing his, his child and that he feels terribly guilty about what happened, he says, no, 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 this is the history of Western art. You know, blah, 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 blah. He, is, 
he, his mind is elsewhere. <laughs> he just doesn't notice that he's just drawn his, the most painfully provocative picture of his own son. Really? I, I thought I was doing the history of modern art. Um, but, um, but then comes the thing that's really wonderful in Sartre, where he tells the story about the homosexual and his friend. There's a man whose entire sexual career has consisted only of sexual relations with other men. And he has a friend who says, look, I don't care that you're homosexual. What I can't stand is the way you deny it. Uh, and and you know, if you would just admit that you're homosexual, I have no problem with that at all. It's just the, the lies you tell about yourself. Because the guy, by the way, says, look, I was in the army. Or you've got to believe he's real. That particular one is really beautiful, you know. Or there's always some reason why he's not a homosexual. He's you know, there's always some some particular reason that happened. I was lonely that summer, you know. Uh, whatever. But then Sartre asks a truly wonderful kind of question, which is, who in this situation is in bad faith, the homosexual or his friend? And he says the the friend is the one who's in bad faith. Because in fact, the homosexual is right. He refuses to be constituted as a homosexual the way a rock is a rock, the way a blackboard is a blackboard. He is free at any moment to be else, you know, and so forth. And that freedom just terrifies his friend. The friend just wants him to categorize, give me a name for what you are. You're a homosexual. Okay, now I know. Okay, I can deal with that. Okay, stay in that little box. Be a homosexual the way a rock is a rock. And everything will be fine. And Sartre is saying that is a demand of bad faith. And in some ways, the part of us that wants Desiderio, just shut up, admit that it's about your son, stop all this nonsense, and just tell us the truth, the, your ignorance, and parenthetically your relief when he finally does, that's bad faith. In some profound way, he's much more actively alive than you are in demanding him to just be settled down and be be what he is. But anyway, and, and the point is that what I love about this piece is that Ellen Paul is on top of all of it at every step. She's really, she's playing the changes in this piece so that we know all that stuff that's been set up. But just to go toward the last few pages uh, on page 38, um, first column, at, at the gallery, as at the gallery, nothing in Vincent's slightly bemused tone suggested that these images had any personal resonance. That the idea of revisiting history, of revising history, might have particular appeal to a man whose happiness had been wrecked by the events of a single night. That a man, an ambitious man in his situation, might sometimes feel he'd been done in by his wife and child. Done in being classic Freudian language, you know, that's psychoanalysis language. Um, yeah, he says at one point, I'll tell you, it's intriguing to think of the relation between Gail and me as being come in sort of Adam and Eve relationship, and then da 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 da, and he, now he's off in the Bible. He's you know he's going da da da, and and then he broke off. This happens two or three times in the piece. The phrase he broke off he didn't break down exactly, but he broke off. You know, he was my child, and I was in the very room while he was herniating. I was in the room there with him. You know. That's the, where you, you, that's the exact place where you liked it suddenly, where you got that, that, that not only she knows, but he knows. And we know that she knows that he knows, and, and so forth. Um, but no, no sooner than that, then he's back to talking about it at the top of the page. Then about his mind hopped furiously from idea to idea. Socialism, Cubism, Barth, Zola, Habermas, names and theories flew like the spray of sawdust being thrown up by a whirling blade. And then we get Gail, his wife, saying, you know, there's a lot about Vincent's life, you know, as he paints. They, they fall in love with each other because he was a painter. They used to have conversations like that all the time. And painting really is about those intellectual conversations, but sometimes you just have to tell them, would you shut the hell up about that stuff? Would you, by the way, shut the hell up about that stuff, said the wife who lives in hell, to her husband who refuses to join her there. Just shut the hell up, will you? Um, and then it, it goes on. Um, we meet Sam, by the way, who, uh, that's actually a Ghostbuster, I think, Gail told me. He isn't a Ghostbuster, objective Sam. Who is he? He's dad. Uh, and then you have that wonderful paragraph where Vincent puts him to bed. Every once in a while we get these jewel-like paragraphs, the thing where he does all the things and then he finally gives him a kiss. 
And then we get that incredible passage about Gail. Gail was raised a Quaker and continues not to attend Quaker meetings. But after her radiation, she stopped. People always say to me, how did you survive it? She said late one afternoon. But you don't have a choice because you don't die. Incredibly powerful. I mean, by the way, that's almost like a haiku expression of her entire. That one little, you don't have a choice because you don't die, is in the way, is in waiting against side by side with Vincent. And she is every bit as powerful and full and lively a creature in this piece as, as Vincent is just on the basis of that one sentence. Anyway, so, uh, so they go on. And then you get this rather remarkable thing where um, uh, in, uh, when they, on another visit, when Sam was first born, Vincent explained, there was an opportunity for denial, and we took advantage of it. We were never sure whether he understood us or whether he saw or didn't. He was like an abstract painting. Um, so now we're flipping the analogies. These paintings are like the history of, uh, are not about the boy, they're about the history of art. And he, the boy, is like an abstract painting here, yeah? When you say he's not acting about this, do you mean that the examples of this are being raised as being analogous? Well, I mean, by the way, the opposite in Sartre to, to the demand for sincerity is authenticity. He, Sartre can't stand people being sincere. He wants them to be authentic. Authenticity, by definition, is something you can be in glimpses, briefly. And even the most authentic act, as it becomes reified into my achievement, begins to fall into the train of bad faith. So authenticity is something you could achieve every once in a while. Uh, and so, it, so there are these moments where he has authenticity. Um, but, and then you get this even weirder moment um, a little bit later where, where he tells the story, I was doing that painting of him in the hospital, and he kept getting sicker and sicker, and I stopped work on that picture turned to the wall and he began to get better and I thought, oh my God, there's something wrong with this picture. So I started the painting of him walking, plein air, uh, because I thought, if I do this, he's going to get better. I mean, by the way, this is the complete opposite of the way he usually is. Instead of doing a painting of him encumbered as an allegory of all of art encumbered, he says, now I'll do a picture of him walking and that will make him better. Now he's totally lost in magic thought. Um, and he goes on and he broke off. Oh, it's so stupid, he bursts out. What would, could be more naive? But the agony of this picture for me was trying to paint it knowing it was only a painting. Can you imagine what it is for this particular painter to say it was only a painting? For whom painting is the most important thing in the world? And, uh, and he goes, I know, crazy, desperation, he says. And then we get this great paragraph out of Helen Paul. It occurred to me that the Marlboro show had developed under a pressure no less intense, perhaps, than the pressure on Sam's unborn brain. That you're in a gallery and all these paintings are pressed against the wall in exactly the same way that the child's brain had been pressing against the wall of his skull. Um, in a way, the analogical impulse has now leapfrogged into her. Um, one of the things that happens at those she, he broke off moments is it, it goes back to Wittgenstein in the Tractatus. Uh, Wittgenstein has, it, it's basically seven points. W one, the world is all that is the case. 1.1, he unpacks that a little bit, 1.12, 1.13, 1.2, it's all, it's 96 pages like that. And it, at the end, it finally gets to the seventh point, effectively the seventh day, of which he says, of that which one cannot speak, of that one must be silent. And all modern philosophy breaks down into two camps based on what he means by that. Does he mean of that of which one cannot speak, it's worthless to talk about it, it's, it's pointless, it's just stupid talk, it's blather. Or is he saying, rather, everything I've up, done up to now is blather. The stuff that's really important, you can't talk about. Uh, I have wasted my life, in some sense. Uh, is he boasting or, or the other way? Is he, is he a mystic, or is he the most secular, hard-ass 
you know, materialist there is. Obviously, he's a mystic, but, but the Anglo-American philosophical school doesn't go there. But there, it's similar to this. And, and sometimes, if I give a class and I tell people to write about the Holocaust, somebody will write back their whole paper. This is a brilliant thing. They're the first person who ever thought of this. It will be, there's nothing you can say. And that's bullshit. Not that it's not the case that there's nothing you can say, but you have to, say, but you have to earn your silence. You have to take things up to the very edge of what is say, sayable to figure out what isn't say, sayable. And just, as, and, and just being silent is not the same as having earned your silence. And in some sense, it seems to me that's what this piece is about. Is, and in fact, it's the, it, that's what that last paragraph is about, where they're talking about that painting. It's a triptych. Let's see if I can find it quickly. Um, yeah. These two with this thing in the middle here. What is that? A boy? Did you say a boy? That's, ex that's exactly what it is. It's a boy. It's a boy. It's a boy. And he calls the painting Untitled Loss. That's earning your silence. Um, Anyway, I think it's a pretty amazing piece. He's a very good writer. At the, bit, at the break, take a look at those. Um, but now let's, um, a change of tempo. Let's go back to our friend uh, Ian Frazier, Sandy Frazier with that piece, Nobody Better, Better Than Nobody. Did you like this, or what'd you think? A piece about Heloise? You love this piece, why? All, all the little weird off the wall details, the tar on her teeth. The motel. Other people? Do you, by the way, find that, do you think he's being condescending about her? This is a piece about where Sandy Frazier goes to interview the most unlikely person to be profiled in the New Yorker, Heloise, for God's sakes, or more exactly, Heloise's daughter, who is keeping her column alive. Uh, is this a a New Yorker looking down his nose at this San Antonio lady, or? or? It's quite the yeah, quite the opposite, I think you're right. It's like finding someone worth writing about. Finding, by the way, somebody who I would describe as a colleague, a fellow writer. And he then was going to tell you the things he admires in her. He admires her generous specificity. He admi there's all these things that he talks about. One of the reasons I, I assigned it is, in this context, is it's another one of these, we talked a little bit about Sandy Frazier last time, and this guy is just so well ventilated. This stuff is just absolutely blustery with, with you have no idea from paragraph to paragraph what's gonna happen next. It seems like it's completely, just talk about free, anything could happen in the next sentence. And, 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 uh, um, and yet I'm gonna insist to you uh, that, that I would try to show you that in fact it's the only way you can get away with this is having a piece that is incredibly well precision engineered. This piece is absolutely sentence by sentence is completely held in check, which allows you to have that feeling of the draftiness of it. But um, but uh, anyway, just looking looking through it. So we're indeed we're going to be doing a profile of Heloise. Uh, so he goes down to San Antonio and, and on page seventy nine at the top, he has her say, uh, he's talking about all the different things that happened with this woman. When she's having trouble with a door that is supposed to open inward but is stuck, she gives a solid shot with her hip, like a basketball player throwing a hip check. Underline that, that's going to be important later on in terms of the structure of this piece. 
When she realizes that someone she has just met is attempting a joke at an unexpected point in the conversation, she does a mild double take and she looks at that person as if the person were a common household object, suddenly revealing a new and different use. He's talking about what, is, what he feels like talking to her, right? And, and, uh, and he goes on from there. She's looking at Sandy, of course, there. Uh, anyway, and so then we get all these, this pile up of these wonderful details. Uh, she imitates sounds all the time when she talks. You know, there's a, there's a yeah, the roof and the ch -ch 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 honk, honk, honk. And so he gives you all this kind of stuff that's coming up. And then, and then he does this thing about, indeed, uh, how he'd driven down to San Antonio. He drove down to San Antonio, by the way, from Montana, which is where he'd been living, because uh, he'd been working on the Great Plains piece at that time. And he drives all the way down the country. And he eventually uh, is looking for a motel, and he finally finds this place called the Miramar Motor Inn. By the way, the Miramar Motor Inn San Antonio is nowhere near any mar to be mirroring at. I mean, it's like, what the hell, the Miramar Motor Inn in the middle of, you know, the middle of the state. Um, I'd seen no signs advertising it. It was on a street that dead-ended at the bottom of 81, at a fence along a freeway, you know, and, and so he, he goes and he puts down his money and the lady behind the counter says, how did you find out about this motel? <laughs> um, I had not been in Texas long before I started having millions of insights about the difference between Texas and the rest of America. I was going to write them down right here, right now, but I thought, nah. <laughs> it's so crazy. It drives the Texas people crazy if you do that. But, um, but one of the things that's going to happen with this piece in terms of the drafty um, tent that he's building in this piece is that you're going to have, excuse me, you're going to have all these Miramar things happening, uh, these paragraphs where Miramar will only gradually do, uh, reveal its, its, its function, but so you have Miramar here and here and here and here. And you also, by the way, have doors. You know, that door here, she knows how to, with a hip check, get the door. Anyway. So then we go on and she, he meets her and um, one of the things that is the key thing about Heloise is that she's not supposed to exist at all. The daughter, Ponce. Remember, the mother had seven miscarriages. This, this girl, this woman, is within an inch of non-existence from the very start. She's a complete fluke that she exists at all. Uh, and the way her mother and now she will deal with all this mortality isn't so much in an analogical delirium as in a practical delirium. She is going to, you know, this person who's totally contingent, who doesn't, you know, who is, who is on the very edge of, of death is continually come up with practically, this is what you do with this, this is what you do with this, this is the good kind of, of sock separator, this is endless and endless amounts of practical delirium as a way of fending off the, the howling mortality which surrounds her existence at all. And, and, and then, by the way, watch, out, watch this here on 84. I mean, you get all these crazy curly cues, but another time, Helen and Heloise, this is the mother, were going shopping and they saw a Chinese man raping a goat. Remember that? Oh, this is there in China. This became a running joke between the couples, and in later years, whenever they called each other long distance, they began the conversation by saying, ba, ba, ba. Okay, let's keep that in the back of your mind. Anyway, he goes on, tells the story about, about Heloise, um, and eventually, uh, at the top of 88 is where you get Heloise had health problems her whole life. In addition to having seven miscarriages, she had the growth in her stomach, she had all these other things. Um, and now we pass by Heloise and we get to her daughter. Um, Heloise, Heloise Ponce on 89 told me how to get to her home. Come out San Pedro, pass there, blah, 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 blah. Go left under the overpass, go straight through the light, if it's green, of course. I liked her instructions because it reminded me of the generous specificity of many of her household hints. Many of these things he describes about her are what he sees as the ideal of a good reporter. Of a, of a good uh, chronicler, the generous specificity. Also the knowledge, the good kind. Oh, that's the good kind of these sock things. Ponce knows that there are sock hangers without teeth, sock hangers with, she knows, she's just, she's just, she's knowledgeable, she knows this stuff. She has generous specificity, she's done her homework, she knows everything. Um, then we get this thing on in 92. Uh, when people complain that a hint in hints from Heloise is sometimes more trouble than the problem it is intended to solve, 
they forget that just by naming the problem, Heloise already has the battle practically won. The battle practically won, by the way, the pun on the word practically there, is almost won and it's also uh, practical delirium. It's a very practical thing. And, and the notion that just by naming something you have accomplished, and that's also a writerly thing to say about her. That's what a writer does. Um, the intelligence at work in Hints from Heloise is confident. Never, 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 ever, never, never, all that stuff. Um, and he's going on just telling all these different things he likes about Heloise. And then you're on page 97. Uh, da, 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 and then he says, what actually happened was I got hardly any sleep in my hotel. So you say, wait a sec, what has all this other stuff been? If now you're going to tell us what actually happened. But that, that kind of, this is a little bit like that Dave Eggers moment, you know, here's what I turned in, but what actually happened is like this. So he's trying to combine them into one essay. And so he now tells a story about what it was like to report this piece. And he, he did this stuff, and, and they go out for, for drinks. He tells them that I stayed at the Miramar. Um, he asked me where I was staying, and I said the Miramar, and he said he'd never heard of it. Um, and they're, they're at this Mexican place, right? And did you see on page 98? I ordered the cabrito, which is goat, and a carta blanca beer, and they brought me two carta blanca beers. Ponce said, did you know that the Chinese have different sweat glands than we do? <laughs> In other words, he doesn't say, you know, because you read it, and you might not even remember it, but that thing about the raping, the Chinese raping the goat, so that when he gets a goat, her free association is the Chinese have different sweat glands than we do. <laughs> just, there, there's a kind of screwball comet, qual, comedy quality to, to her. And then at, uh, at one point, uh, Ponce, uh, some guy with a beard came up to Ponce on 99 and asked her where she worked, and she said, I'm a writer. And he said, you work for writer trucks? <laughs> Which again, I mean, she's a writer. And, and he is not making fun of that. Everything that's come before this makes you understand that he sees her as a fellow writer. Do you, the, yeah. Do you think that his absolute detail is like getting drunk? There's definitely that quality, and it's going to become even more so in a second. He's getting more and more drunk. And now, by the way, we are going to have one of those patented Sandy Fraser spin-outs that, in fact, is going to be the, the towering strut that holds the whole piece together in a way that you can't quite understand. He's drunk, and he goes to the bathroom, and he's in the mall, and the door behind, back to the bar had locked behind me. He knows how to deal with doors, but he doesn't. The door locks behind him. Uh, and now you get this two-page thing where he's lost in the bar, he's trying to get back in, the policeman stops him, the policeman is, is Chicano, uh, a Latino name, and he thinks, I thought it's white people arrested Latinos, not the other way around, it's just this complete, and then, and then, and then by the way, because you have the Miramar thing wrapped around here, I'd like to hold up another thing here, the policeman says to him, where, do you st where are you staying? He says, the Miramar, <laughs> and, and uh, uh, the policeman says, what motel are you staying at? And I said, the Miramar. He said, well, you better not go flashing that money around the Miramar if you want to hang on to it. <laughs> it's just again, like, he's endlessly being told what's going on. He's clueless, as, you know, completely clueless as it's going, as going forward. Anyway, so then there, more things happen, crazier things, and indeed there are all these wonderfully weird things going on. Um, and... Uh, and at one point, you get this, you go, once again, go into that tunnel as opposed to the, the road where, where they go about uh, Heloise's death and how she's sick and how the husband, Ponce's husband, goes in to help her and she has a gun underneath her. <laughs> she's going to get out of here and he walks out. I mean, all uh, this, this kind of her mortality suddenly, the mother's mortality is really a very poignant scene in the middle of all this hilarity. But we keep on going. And. Uh, I love, this is one of the great euphemisms in American literature. Barry works for, Mex for Mexicans who own private planes. <laughs> in other words, they're drug, drug traffickers. <laughs> if you're in Texas and you work for a Mexican who owns a private plane, <laughs> and that plays off of the, I thought it was whites who, who arrest Latinos, not the other way around. Um, then they meet this other guy at the bar. He has two professions. He's a dentist and an undertaker, <laughs> which has, by the way, a sub-theme that, that they, in the history of dentists, dentists used to be barbers, right? The reason, you, the reason when, you go, when, you, when you go to a, 
Denison, they have the pole with the red and white because they used to be, the barbers used to be dentists. That's what the red and the white, the, the blood on, on the pole was. But. To, to buy teeth from dead people, so an undertaker to help, so that would make it, yeah, so, I mean, all this stuff is really cool. Anyway, so he's, so once again, you know, they're all sitting around the bar, and he said, where, do you, where are you staying? I told him I was staying at the Miramar. The Miramar, he said. The Miramar? You're staying at the Miramar? He gave the name an inflection unrepresented by any typeface. <laughs> I cannot believe it. Don't you know about the Miramar? Haven't you heard about the Miramar? And, uh, my God, James Revelly said, the Miramar is the biggest damn rut hut in San Antonio. Haven't you noticed all the traffic? Right, I think there was a thing earlier on about the banging at night, you know, that was going out of the hotel. <laughs> was, and I love this, I think. Uh, why, that's the busiest hotel, motel in town at lunch hour. You want to find a lawyer, lawyer in San Antonio at lunch hour, you go to the Miramar. There's a little barbecue place around the corner from the Miramar where they have great ribs. And if you go ask a girl at lunch if she wants to go to get some ribs, most of them know that that's just a code word for going to the Miramar, which is just a code word for shacking up. <laughs> which, by the way, is just a code word for fucking. <laughs> but, 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 it's, it's the layers of code, you know, they're going on here. The Miramar, you know, oh, the Miramar. They're all cracking up laughing. It's completely hilarious. Um, so, again, this, this drafty tent has been constructed very nicely. It's wonderfully free. But now we're coming to the thing that, that comes off of here, it started here and it's gonna end here because he goes to her house uh, one last time and she makes him a sandwich. By the way, one of the things I didn't even mention at all, all her wonderful pets, the, the cockatoo, Zinfandel, and the, and the uh, corgi, she's got all these great names for their pets. But so we're coming to the end of the story. Uh, she washes her hands, she made lunch. Uh, she put the mayonnaise back in the refrigerator and then asked me if I'd like a pickle. And I said yes, and she went to open the refrigerator. Her refrigerator is the kind that closes with a hiss as the rubber vacuum seal around the door shuts, sucks it shut, and then won't let go for 30 seconds so that it is impossible to shut the door and immediately reopen it. Shoot, she said, and stood by the refrigerator door. By the way, not shit, she said shoot. I like that, but shoot, she said. The wasted seconds were almost visible, expiring in the air around her. Isn't there some kind of hint that would solve this problem, I asked? No, she said, there is absolutely nothing you can do about this at all. <laughs> She's the kind of person who knows how to open a door. The door clicks shut behind me, and then there's a the kind of door that there's nothing you can do about at all. This is the first time in the history of writing where being unable to open the door after you put the mayonnaise in the refrigerator is a symbol of mortality. And uh, the end, the end, when will you look it squarely in the face? Uh, so, anyway. Uh, and I, we're running a little late here, so I'll go fast on to the next thing. And then I had you look at, at that passage from family. Um, the other, uh, Ian Fra this is that book, I read you that passage a while back about uh, uh, General Sherman's death and, and uh, across the river and into the trees. Um, this is another part of it where, this is the book he wrote about his own family. And at a certain point, he tells the same to story twice. He tells the story of suburbanization and the town of Hudson where he grew up. By the way, the town of Hudson, um, from Hudson to New York is the story of his life. From Ohio's Hudson to, to the Canal Street Hudson. But, uh, but so he tells a sociological analysis that all these things were happening, which is why you ended up getting suburbia. Um, and so he goes on describing quite, in much the same way that, that McPhee in, in, uh, in the uh, LA versus the mountains, the Foothill Boulevard, was US 66 and it brought the immigrants in, the, the debris flow of immigrants of all this history and so forth. So one way you could tell this story, and there's nothing wrong with telling it this way, it's just the sociological facts, and he tells it very entertainingly about why suburbia happened. Um, but that's not the way it was experienced by the people while it was happening. And so then he tells the same story again in a completely different register about going home. 
and so sometimes he gets the urge to go back, and he, and, he, and he drives all night, and he ends up arriving in Hudson, and he feels an emotion which was a mile wide, but which turned out later to be only an inch deep, which, by the way, is not true. You're about to, in this next section, get some of the most deep writing about America ever, where he just basically, he'll get in a car. First of all, he waits for the, uh, he drinks a beer while he waits for the traffic jam to sort itself out. And now evenings come on, and then I go for a drive. And he drives all around his childhood haunts, and he looks at the houses, and he thinks, she was my fifth grade in my fifth grade class, and one winter day I was walking home without any gloves, and she saw me, put on gloves, came out to the side door, knocked me down, and washed my face with snow. She grew up to be smart and shy. And now he's going to do a series of these little riffs in the strange verb tense, which is the, the it's not exactly past, it's the eternal past as present. It's the way that these things that happen long ago are persistent forever. There's an American play that's in this tense too, right? Our Town, Thornton Wilder, the stage manager, the tense in which he speaks, you know, which is that, that these things are somehow eternal. And, and it's a very wonderful verb tense to write in. Uh, it's, it's all knowing and yet aware that it could have gone some other way, but it didn't go that way, it went this way. And it grows up, in, it, it just gets more and more emotionally deep. So it's bullshit that this is an inch deep. This is, this is incredibly deep, you know, the guy who ends, and how many of them die? You know, the one ends up in Vietnam, dead in Vietnam. She stood by the lockers outside the cafeteria at high school at Nance. Her hips cocked like a fist. This other one who, uh, Oh, then there's that great, great, great paragraph. Uh, she was 16 or 17, and I was 12 or 13, and her grandmother was my piano teacher. And one day, I was sitting in the parlor waiting for my piano lesson, and she was upstairs singing It's in His Kiss, the Shoop Shoop song, as loud as she could. And the mailman came and went at the front door, and she ran downstairs singing to get the mail, and she was wearing nothing but glasses and bikini underpants. And my piano teacher appeared and screamed, Renee, there's a boy here. And Renee stopped and looked right at me for a long moment, and I looked at her, and then she turned and went back upstairs. That's a great paragraph. Uh, he was the most talented kid in town. Da, 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 da. He killed himself. One after another, these, these heartbreaking things. There, there are, by the way, two passages in here which are metaphors for the whole thing. There's one that goes, she sat by the hockey pond Oh, but before that, by the way, this. To her senior prom, she wore a gown made of dyed bed sheets. She became a newscaster in Florida and shot herself to death on live television. For the next one. She sat by the hockey pound, pond on a still night, dangled her feet in the water, and a while later, the ripples made the street light on the opposite side of the pond waver. That's a metaphor of what's happening here. What's happening here is, you know, all the waverings that started back when he was 13, 14, 15 years old are rippling up against his consciousness now. And then later on, she and I went to a golf course late one night and took off our shoes and ran across the fairway. And the moon was so bright that when she looked back, we could see our footprints, but that when we looked back, we could see our footprints far behind us in the dew. Which is again a metaphor for what's happening in this whole passage. And it ends up being about his girlfriend and his father's attitude toward the girlfriend and then and you get just, and then it slowly turns out to be about, about the brother who died, um, and is the defining moment of his life. How to achieve a relationship with, between that and the truth is on the last page, being in Hudson often fills me with anxiety. Feelings rise up to me, an internal tantrum of them. And he goes on talking about that, and then he says, uh, I remember getting into the car to drive home from the hospital after Fritz died. My mother sat at the front, and we kids in the back, our numbers now permanently reduced by one. By the way, he, he driving is remembering another drive. Um, and my father in the driver's seat took his leather gloves from under the visor and put them on, carefully pulling each finger to. I thought it was remarkable that he could do that after his son had just died. He bought Fritz a plot in Markilly Cemetery in Hudson, and at the same time bought two plots adjoining it. Why two? 
why not six or none? In other words, why not one for all of us? Maybe he couldn't bear to think of his son there alone without some of us there to keep him company. Maybe he knew that the end of Fritz's life meant, in some ways, the end of his and of my mother's. I'm ready to go back to the motel. And he starts going back. And uh, uh, he's driving by the cemetery. The gates are locked. Houses are built all around the grounds. Backyard decks now overlook the graves. As I drive by, I shout out to my parents and to my brother, which is the same moment as uh, Montana. I'd go there to Montana, you know, that blast of energy that comes at the end of an incredibly deep emotional passage in, in Sandy Frazier, which is why, class, once again, who is the best writer of Professor's Generation? Will be on the desk. Stephen Frazier. Anyway, let's take a quick break. Okay, uh, let's continue here. I should mention, by the way, that in the readings that will be available tonight or tomorrow on, online, I have one of Sandy Fraser's great, great pieces, uh, Laws Concerning Food and Drink, Household Principles, Lamentations of the Father. Do you know about this? Uh, this is a piece about what it's like to be a father, but told in the biblical register. Of the beasts of the field, and of the fishes of the sea, and of the f all the foods that are acceptable in my sight, you may eat, but not in the living room. Of the hoofed animals broiled or ground into burgers, you may eat, but not in the living room. Of the cloven hoof animal, plain or with cheese, you may eat, but not in the living room. Of the cereal grains, of the corn and of the wheat, and of the oats, and of all cereals that are bright of color and of unknown provenance, you may eat, but not in the living room. Of the quiescently frozen dessert, and of all frozen after meal treats, you may eat, but absolutely not in the living room. Of the juices and the other beverages, yes, even of those in sippy cups, you may drink, but not in the living room, neither may you carry the, such therein. Indeed, when you reach the place where the living room carpet begins, of any food or beverage, there you may not eat, neither may you drink. But if you are sick, and if you are lying down and watching something, then you may eat in the living room. And it goes on like that, and it's, it's incredible, and it is not only the best thing I've ever written about being a parent, but also the, probably the best thing I've ever written about being God, and how incredibly futile it is, and so forth. But anyway. So I recommend that. Uh, okay, so now I just wanted to, in a second, be talking about the, my Breitenbach piece in this context. But I thought I'd start by reading, uh, by recalling for you the piece that was in the readings about Stanislav Lem, where Stanislav Lem writes this book of perfect reviews of non-existent books. And in this case, he, uh, the one you read, what I, if you were to summarize it, it's, it's two completely berserk uh, statisticians, one of whom is reviewing the other one's book, and the one, this one guy has, has decided to calculate the odds against his own ever having been born. And he says, for me to be born, my father had to turn right and my mother had to turn left at that crucial moment. And so right there, it's 50 percent, it's only 25 percent chance that they both turn the right way. And, and, and then he goes through the things, and uh, Archduke Ferdinand have to have been shot, and, uh, and da da da. And he's able, through a kind of rigorous thing to prove that the odds against his ever having been born are infinite. And, the, and his opponent, the, this other statistician, uses exactly the same data to prove that it was inevitable that he was born, which is in fact where human life transpires, somewhere between, it, or rather where the impossible and the inevitable meet. That's where human life <laughs> takes place. Um, and then side by side with that, and by the way, with, with these Polish poets, as I said last time, you're dealing with poets who, and Stanislav Lem, the great, the great science fiction writer, who did Solaris, among other things. These are people who have experienced the whole 20th century. These are people for whom the fact that they were born at all and then survived this horrible carnage of World War I and World War II and Stalinism and so forth, you know, is, is nothing short of miraculous, which in turn comes through in that poem of Zimborska's called Could Have. It could have happened, it had to happen, it happened earlier, later, nearer, farther off. It happened, but not to you. You were saved because you were the first. You were saved because you were the last. Alone with others on the right, the left, because it was raining, because of the shade, because the day was sunny. 
You were in luck there was a forest. You were in luck there were no trees. You were in luck a rake, a, bro a hook, a beam, a break, a jam, a turn, a quarter inch, an instant. You were in luck. Just then a straw went floating by. Do you understand that? You're hiding underwater and you're going to drown, but you can't come up because the Nazis are going to kill you. You were in luck just then a straw went floating by. You were able to breathe. As a result, because although despite what would have happened if a hand, a foot, within an inch, a hair's breadth from an unfortunate coincidence? So you're here, still dizzy from another dodge, close shave, reprieve. One hole in the net and you slipped through. I couldn't be more shocked or speechless. Listen how your heart pounds inside me. Uh, sometimes when I'm teaching a class, if there's 40 students in the class, I'll give each of them one word from this thing and ask them to write the short story. Write the story of a jam, a break. Just then, I mean, this is a bookshelf of novels in extreme, extreme compressed form. Eamon Grennan, who I think we read a poem of last week, I'm not sure, but anyway, uh, he has a poem which does a similar thing in his book, Still Life with Waterfall. On slow wings, the marsh hawk is patrolling possibility soaring, sliding down almost to ground level, twisting suddenly at something in the marsh hay or the green grass. They're autumnal colors snagging his eye where he finds the slightest aberration, any stir that isn't the winds, and abruptly plunges on it. Then if he's lucky and that scuttling minutia of skin and innards, its hot pulse hammering isn't, he will settle there and take in what's happened severing the head first, then ripping the bright red strings that keep the blood in check, and then eyes, gizzard, heart, and so to the bones, cracking and snapping each one, that moves so swift and silent and sure of itself, only a minute ago, in the sheltering grass. That's the same poem from the other side. I mean, the one poem is all the ways you get away. This is the poem of the one way that you don't get away. And Coming back to the theme of the day about freedom, it seems to me that that again is, is where life is lived. Sartre, in, in his book, What is Literature, so he's stopped taking speed for a few minutes. And we're now in 1947. And he writes, this is him writing in 47 about what he's just been through. We were not unaware that a time would come when historians would be able to survey from all angles this stretch of time which we lived feverishly minute by minute. But the irreversible, irreversibility of our age belonged only to us. We had to save ourselves in this irreversible time. These events pounded, pounced upon us like thieves, and we had to do our best in the, faith, in the face of the incomprehensible and untenable to bet, to conjecture, without evidence, to undertake in uncertainty and persevere without hope. Our age would someday be explained, but no one could keep it from having been inexplicable to us. Isn't that fantastic? And that's what you have to keep alive when you're writing about. You can explain everything that happened to them, but that will have nothing to do with what it was like to live through. What it was like to live through was that they had to be making decisions every second of the way, constantly making decisions. There's a nice uh, conversation between uh, Sheila Hetty, wonderful story writer, and Leonard uh, Blonto, not to now, how do you pronounce this guy? The guy who's just written a book about the drunkard's walk, do you know this? But anyway, she says, I've been thinking about fiction while reading your books, and the word fiction makes so much more sense to me because fiction suddenly does seem like a fiction. At one point, you quote the historian Richard Henry Taunay, who says, Historians give an appearance of inevitability by dragging into prominence the forces which have triumphed and thrusting into the background those that, have, that were swallowed up. And that was, that's what fiction writers do too, to make events seem like a causality, right? There's the essence of a good story. One thing leads to the next. But there's so many forces that could uh, lead us in a different direction. There's so much randomness and chance, things that push our lives in completely other directions, while fiction encourages a belief in fate which he, he's the author of The Drunkard's Walk, Laudanau. Uh, 
um, he says, sure, and what Einstein found in 1905 was that if you look at a molecule, it moves around. It follows a drunkard's walk because of the collisions from unseen other molecules that are hitting it. In hindsight, you can say these molecules hit it from the left, and so it moved to the right, and after that, these molecules hit it from below, and so it moved up. You can find reasons for all its turns in hindsight, but at the time, there are so many molecules moving in it from so many directions that you, couldn't, you can't tell which one is going to hit it, uh, and the next one is going to have even more possibilities because you don't know which one hit it the last time, so there's a huge branching tree of almost endless possibilities. You can't predict the future, but you can understand the past. That's why historians say the past often seems inevitable only after the fact. In fiction, you want to have it to be that something happens, the audience can look back and say, oh yeah, A, B, C, D happened, and so of course this was, was what was going to happen. But you don't want them to see it before it happens, right? And Sheila says, yes, but then doesn't fiction train our brains to think in ways that are sort of the opposite to the ways in which your book would want us to think? You mean encourage them to believe in fate and inevitability? Yes. And he goes on, well, I think I'm not enough of a psychologist to know whether it convinces us or whether it preys upon our convictions. But anyway, I say all this in the context of, of now turning to the piece I wrote about Brayton, Brayton Buck. Um, in the Calamities of Exile book. Um, do any of you know Brayton here? I, he teaches here. Do any of you? Uh, a horrible face, but one's own. Um, what do you think of this? Again, I'm, I'm not here. <laughs> Right. So you're saying you haven't finished it yet, but you have but that orange metaphor, the orange or the fact of that orange thing plays out at you. Um, since we're kind of short on time, I'll, I'll dive right in um, and talk about the way that I'm basically writing about a person. Well, let me read the very first, par first paragraph. I once asked Brayton Breitenbach the exiled South African poet and painter, why, in his opinion, after the fiasco of his clandestine return to his homeland in 1975, traveling incognito as a would-be revolutionary organizer, the calamity of his arrest, his cover having likely been blown even before he entered the country, such that not only was he arrested, but virtually everyone he connected with, contacted, was arrested as well. The debacle of his trial, his appalling, groveling, breakdown, his operatic recantations, his ex expressions of contrition, all to no avail. After his having been sentenced to nine years hard time in the country's notori notorious penal system, why, I asked him, had the authorities who had allowed him to go on writing in prison nevertheless forbidden him to paint? And he goes on, he ta we were in Paris now, it, he'd been released in 82, and, and, and we were looking through the canvases he painted, and um, he paused for a moment to think about the question, and then he said, they weren't stupid. I think they must have realized that for me, an empty, can uh, an empty canvas would have been an open field of freedom, and they weren't going to allow me that. Such that those sentences are, are setting up the whole thing. Quiet back there. Um, they, are, they are, on the one hand, they're giving you all the th themes about it's just inevitable. This is going to be catastrophic. This is going to be the most horrible story you've ever heard. This guy is going to fuck up in ways that are truly profound and spectacular. And then he's going to fuck up on top of that. He's going to fuck up and fuck up and fuck up. And, uh, and yet it tells you that the theme of this piece is going to be about freedom. It's going to be a prisoner talking, thinking about freedom. And it's also one of the techniques, in a way that first paragraph works the way the first paragraph worked in, in the piece about my grandfather, the whole Sherahar thing. All the themes that are going to be in the piece are already there in that first paragraph. 
And I also am telling you the story up front. There's nothing you're not gonna, that's going to come as a surprise in what follows. And yet, when I, I'm now going to go back and tell the story a second time, and every step of the way you're going to be saying, no, Brayton, don't do that. Oh, 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 no, oh. Not the stewardess. Oh, Brayton, oh, no. You know, and you're going to have this quality going through that every step of the way he was free to have chosen other ways that he just that wasn't able to do it and so forth. So although it, it, you're going to have both these things simultaneously working all the way through the piece, and in fact the theme is going to be about freedom, about what constitutes freedom and so forth. So anyway, um, I go on, and indeed I... I, I have this drawing that he did in prison, which will turn out to be these drawings are another whole fiasco, which you'll find out later on. But and it's the orange three to, four times, uh, and indeed you see an orange, an orange, just with the uh, with the rind having been peeled off, almost completely eaten, and then there's nothing else. So there's the fourth time is the one that you don't is when it's been completely eaten. Uh, and that, in turn, reminds me of this painting he'd done when it, once he got out of prison of himself as a child, himself in prison, himself out of prison, stunted and so forth. And I say to myself, this is Brayton four times, which, by the way, right away sets up what the form of the piece is going to be. And indeed, you're going to find, and you might, you're going to, is it going to be Roman numeral one, two, three, four? Is it going to be Roman numeral one, two, three? And I mean, it's all, this is the prelude to the piece. And as you'll find out as you read it, it goes Roman numeral one, two, three, and there'll be a coda, which is the orange the fourth time. But um, anyway, so we go on, and, and, and part one begins with telling you how I wrote the story, uh, how I got the story, in much the same way that part one in the piece about my grandfather's, my Sandy Koufax and all that stuff. Here, the role of Sandy Koufax is played by Vermeer, where I, I went to, to the Penn Conference uh, here at the St. Moritz Hotel and was just going to do a talk story. And he, he was the most interesting guy around, and, and, uh, and I, but he was all talked out. So we go up to the Metropolitan and we walk through all the, the, uh, the different displays. Um, and at one point, we come to the Vermeer and everybody in this town knows the Vermeer, the woman with the silver pitcher, and there's the totally peaceful picture, and behind her is the map of Holland. And easily one of the strangest reactions I've ever heard to that painting. He says, ah, look, it's hard to believe that from all that serenity emerges the boar, he says, and he points to the map. He says, look, that's them leaving right now. And that could have been the talk piece, but instead I went to Sean and I said, I think it would be really cool if we did a whole piece about it. So he said, go ahead. It would take me seven years to write this piece. Um, and uh, it turned out to be much, much more difficult than I thought. And in fact, I wrote the other two pieces in this book as exercises to figure out how to write this piece. I mean, all three of the pieces in this book are about basically decent people who try to do the right thing with regard to the totalitarian regime in their home country, the thing that you would do if you were a lot braver, and get totally fucked up. And so it's kind of a CAT scan of what totalitarianism is like, how it takes the best impulses and curdles them and turns them inside out. And all three of the pieces did that, but it wasn't until I'd done the other two that I was able to learn enough to do this one. But anyway, so at that point, um, so once again we have the, uh, in this piece, um, the prelude, then we have Roman numeral one, Roman numeral two, number three, and then we're going to have the coda. And if you think about it, in each case, one way of thinking about it is, is they're about comings and going. Wherever he is, he wants to be in the other place. When he's in Paris, he longs to be back in South, a South Africa. When he's in, uh, and by the way, the piece begins with the, there go the Boer right now, from Europe down to Africa. And I'll tell you right away that, that among those war on that boat are his ancestors, the Clutes, and, and he is the history of South Africa in that sense. Um, but he goes into exile. And so in effect, the, whole, the, the first part is going to be all about being in Europe, having this incredible career where he becomes the greatest Afrikaner language poet, writing the greatest Afrikaner erotic poetry of all time about a colored woman. <laughs> 
the Vietnamese woman, which is driving the Afrikaners crazy because they don't know what to do with this. They love the, they're very into culture, so they want the poetry, but they can't stand that it's about a colored woman. And anyway, he is beginning to feel that poetry isn't enough. And then, so the, the first thing, he's in, this is his parents' life, and it ends with him going back into Africa in this totally stupid, insane notion. He's the most famous poet in the country, and he's going to go back incognito. Uh, and his incognito is just putting on a mustache, basically. Like, that's going to disguise him. It would be like, you know, Allen Ginsberg coming to, to town, you know, with his hair in a crew cut or something, you know. Anyway, but, but so then this is, then we're going to have the middle part of the book uh, is going to be his time in South Africa, presently in, in prison, arrested, total fiasco, complete catastrophe. Uh, the fulcrum of the, of the piece is going to come here. There's actually going to be a double fulcrum here as well as last time. But, and, then, and then finally, it's going to end with him finally getting out of prison and going back to Paris. And this is uh, the last thing is going to be whether he can stand being in Paris or whether he's going to try and go back again. I mean, so there's, that's the, a natural thing that's going on through here. Um, the piece is going to divide. The absolute division of the piece is going to come. Now, I should have found the page number, darn it. But it's at the moment where he gets arrested. Um, let's see if I can find it quickly. Uh, so he goes into to South Africa, traveling incognito. Uh, and uh, let me just find it here. Yeah. Uh, and, he, and everybody he talks to has already been betrayed. There are literally going to be 40 people sent to prison because of him being such an asshole and such a fool. And then, one, and, but, but, so now he's trying to get out of the country, and he's at the airport, uh, and there's a uh, page that the guy who he's disguised as should report, you know, he reports, and, and he's being taken away. As he was being led into a small side office, he caught a brief glimpse of his own reflection in the window pane as he passed. Looking into South Africa, he had written, now I'm going to put a mirror right here. I'm going to put this whole piece divides right at this point. And he says, looking into South Africa, he had written years earlier, is like looking into the mirror at midnight when one has pulled a face and the train blew its whistle and one's image stayed there fixed for all eternity, a horrible face but one's own, uh, which is the title of the piece, and is also a mirror aimed at the reader. Well, it's all very good for you to sit there, you know, making your judgments about this guy. But looking into South Africa, for anybody outside of South Africa, you suddenly, your, your, your face is frozen, a horrible face but one's own. And so there's a whole kind of mirroring thing that happens here. And, he, and, uh, and then, by the way, I do that drunken porter thing that we were talking about last time, which is this is the scariest moment of all. At one level, it's the genophiles, the, the stuff that's come up to the, and now we're going to forget about the genophiles for a while. And, and, uh, and it's, he's just been arrested. Oh my God, what's going to happen to him? In fact, you have a sense of what's going to happen. I already told you what's going to happen. But we stop for a second, and then we get his friend Ampi Kutsi describing what it was like for him to be arrested. And it's this very, very funny, he has this hilarious description about it, how they tell him to write it down, and then he writes it, and then they tell him to write it again. He says, they're really smart, those guys. You know, and he, he, it's a rather hilarious description of sheer terror that happens at that point. We don't know what's happening yet to Brayton. And then it goes on, and, and we get to the trial. And the second moment of, of just horror in this piece is, is his behavior at the trial, where he, you know, just... Uh, completely fucks up and, 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 and apologizes for his poetry and is doing anything. Now, one thing that's amazing about this, this is a guy who had trained in Zen. You would think that a Zen trainee would be of some use to you if you were going to be put in solitary confinement. In fact, it's of no use whatsoever. He is totally panic-stricken. As well, he should be, by the way. He is the last person on earth that should be in prison uh, in terms of his, his constitution to be able to be in prison. But more than importantly, he is the one person the Afrikaner intellectual elite who run the prison system has died to get a hold of. And they are going to be fucking, because he's the poet, he's, he's, and they want him to start singing their praises. And he's going to do it just to get out, if he could just get out. And, it's, and 42 people have been sent to prison, and he's fucking up spectacularly and so forth. It was partly because he had written a book about this called The Confessions of an Albino Terrorist, where he kind of poeticizes what happened. But when I read the actual testimony, I said, oh, this is too horrible. I can't even, this is just too horrible. I can't stand this. And I, there was a whole period where I could have imagined uh, 
writing about him at all. I mean, I just know how to deal with this. Um, in any case, and then, and, but then somehow he manages to stabilize himself. Now, I haven't even gotten into this weirdness about his brothers, one of whom is, the, is, is in, the, in the secret police, the boss, as it's called, uh, of South Africa, the apartheid regime, and the other one is, is like one of the worst war criminals in history. He would absolutely have been sent to the, to the Hague if, if, uh, if uh, the, the, the Kasimba massacre, which I described as one of the really horrible, horrible massacres. Anyway, so you've got all this going on, but somehow, despite this absolute horror that he goes through during that period, and by the way, everybody abandons him, abandons him, totally. Um, um, and despite the horror of it all, uh, he, uh, he somehow stabilizes himself, and he begins to behave well, and he's transferred to Paulsmore, and he becomes actually the requisitions person for Nelson Mandela, you know, getting him his blankets and so forth, and, and eventually comes out, and you get that great moment, which is exactly the same moment that we had in, in, in the, uh, in, in the missing plane where he's brought out of prison and he's brought to Yolanda, his wife, and she says, what are you doing here? Remember, like the other one was, where the hell have you been? What are you doing here? That could have been the title of this whole piece. What are you doing here with this kind of here going back and forth? Uh, and, and she's released and that ends part two. Um, but again, I want to suggest that, that the way this is written, I hope, gives you a sense of, of a series of independent decisions he makes one after another, which are just the wrong decision, the wrong decision, and then parenthetically the right decision and so forth, he stabilizes. But he emerges a completely destroyed person. And then, by the way, a, an echo of this moment here occurs right here, where looking into South Africa had been like looking into a mirror. By the way, I should say that that was the same thing for me as, as the moment where McPhee saw the thing about the musket fire. When I read that piece of Brayton, which was not at all in the context of his prison memoirs, it was just a sentence he'd written about Amir, I suddenly said, huh, huh, huh. I could put that in the middle of the piece. I could have it mirror in every direction, mirror this way, mirror that way, you know, and, and, and it suddenly organized things for me. In the way that, by the way, this whole theme of freedom and determination is represented by people looking at themselves in the mirror. What am I going to do? What am I going to do right now? That moment where you wake up in the morning and you, you know, flash your face and you're looking in the mirror. What is that person in the mirror, the reified me, going to have done by the end of the afternoon? All that's being played out and so forth. But then when we come here, you get that wonderful sentence where he says that he couldn't paint. He was afraid he would never be able to paint again. Uh, especially he hadn't seen colors in all that time. And, and, uh, and so the first thing he does is paint a picture of himself in the mirror, uh, but, uh, and his eyes are closed. And you remember why he says his eyes are closed? It's a picture of himself looking in the bathroom mirror uh, with his eyes closed. And I ask him, you know, why do you have your eyes closed? And he says, I wasn't ready to look at myself yet. A really strange thing to say because who or what is looking at who or what when a person pictures, paints a picture of themselves with their eyes closed. Uh, and who are we looking over the shoulder of that gaze? Uh, it's interesting, by the way, I think, do I have it here? I'm not sure. No, I don't. In The New Yorker, we had a portrait when this came out. Richard Avedon did a portrait of, of Breitenbach. And Breitenbach is the only person I've ever known who was able to defeat Avedon. Avedon always gets the picture he wants, not the picture the person wants. And so here's the picture that Brayton got Avedon to take of him. And what's fascinating, if you think about it, is that, let's see, where is it? This is somebody in complete command of the self-image he wants pre presented. Uh, but this is the picture with their eyes closed. Anybody else 
talk about human freedom. After this horrid, wretched story, we're just, I'm never going back there. <laughs> in fact, I'm never getting out of the house. I'm saying, I've caused enough trouble in the world. I'm just going to lie low. Nothing's going to happen. And then Act 3 is this whole remarkable thing where he, in fact, does go back. And in fact, plays a very, very important role in history. Those, if you go the history of the downfall of, of apartheid, that, that meaning of the Afrikaner businessmen with the ANC in Dakar is a terribly important thing. Basically, the jig is up for the regime when that happens. The regime has been trying to keep their businessmen from talking to the ANC and successfully doing so for 40 years. And when that happens, the jig is up. And, and he arranged that. Um, and so, so you get that remarkable thing happening. And, uh, and so he, in fact, does go back. And then we have the, the coda. And the coda, by the way, is Sartre, uh, I assure you that Paris, Parisian Breitenbach knows his Sartre. Um, and so we're at the end of the piece, right here in the coda. A few days later, I joined Brayton and Yolanda in a stout stone farmhouse in the hills outside a small town, a few hours train ride from Barcelona. This is this farmhouse where they managed to find a little place to stay now. Um, actually, I'm going to tell you something. That was the real problem about why I couldn't write this. While I was writing this, something I don't write in the piece is that that Yolanda, the regime, had said to, let's remember, Yolanda is somebody who was on the verge of divorcing him, this beatnik bohemian, when he left, and didn't even tell her he was leaving. Remember how the last section of, he had, he had left South Africa without telling his parents, and now he was going to go back into South Africa without telling his wife? And the crisis of their marriage was that she wanted to have children. He didn't want to have children. He was busy being a yoga, zen, bohemian poet and had no interest in having children. And, and suddenly he gets arrested and behaves horribly and everybody abandons him. And she, far from abandoning him, throws herself into going down there. And it's horrible. I mean, they treat, they strip search her, this very diminutive Vietnamese woman. And even though she's not allowed to see him, to touch him, they're off the size of a glass wall, notwithstanding what she's strip searched every time, it's just horrible, horrible, horrible stuff that happens. Um, and um, um, I was going to play, uh, in fact, I will play you, actually, right, I'll play this right now, then I'll tell you the rest of the story. Um, so hold that thought for a second. And before we go on, I just, we'll stay a little bit longer than we thought we would. Uh, I wanted to tell that when I wasn't able to write this, for reasons which I'll explain in a second, I, I turned into a radio piece. And there's a 30-minute radio piece that I did, which for the time was good enough for the time being. And I thought I never, never, would never return to it. But I thought I'd just play you a second, uh, a minute or two of the radio piece. Um, and you'll, see, you'll hear him at the beginning. We did a thing where he's reciting a poem about what he wants to say to Yolanda in prison, about how he's longing to come back with her and so forth, to be with her. And we have the poem both in English and him reading it in English in Afrikaans. And then there'll be the clatter of noises, and, and then you'll hear a second that you'll recognize. Uh, so let me see if I can get this thing to start you going here. Let's see here. I can already taste a small snow yellow grain and a bit of butter and a bottle of pitch dark Sidi Ibrahim smacking on the sun and the sea. And then what would you say to a tea alaman in the flower deck glasses all scalding wet? Listen to that same wind calling through the old, old Paris streets. You are the one I love, yeah, yes, my and friend. I'm feeling so and good. So good. <laughs> 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 
Thank you, Devon. By the way, right now we're in a cafe, and I'm going to do all the establishing noises of a cafe because he's going to tell me an amazing story. But in the story, there's going to be all these noises, so you have to establish. It's exactly when you're writing, you have to do the same thing. You have to. It has to take place in a place. It's not a story that's just floating in midair. It, you have to. I think I told you about the rule of three, Flaubert's rule of three, that if you want to describe any new scene, you have to describe three specific things in the scene, the table, the window, the vase, and now it's three-dimensional and people can walk around in it. And in the same way, I'm doing, giving you an oral, an A-U-R-A-L, oral sense of where you are, because now we're going to continue. There is, of course, a real sense in which one can talk about going to prison or being in prison, and it, I suppose one could see it visually. It's, all, it's a sense of, of perspective or the sense of going into closed, into closed spaces, closed spaces but which are at the same time mysterious spaces. It is like uh, building up a painting with false perspectives all the time, half walls, uh, corridors leading off into in infinity. Uh, the one particular prison that I have in mind now, uh, called Beverly Hills, we call it Beverly Hills in Pretoria. It's the hanging jail where they execute people, up to about 200 a year. Now that has as its central characteristic the actual chamber, the, the room where people are executed. But since if you live in that prison, you never see it. You are intensely aware of it. You know it's there. You can hear it. You can hear the room because you can hear the trap doors opening. You know, sort of the shuddering going through the building when, when, when people actually are being hanged in the morning. And then you hear the coffins being put together. Uh, hearing this room or this, this, this enclosure without actually seeing it makes up at the very mysterious heart of the place. I think there's a real way in which senses merge there. Um, you literally see with your ears. You see with your ears and you hear all these noises in the background, by the way. You, you, so you are, your, your ears are being trained into, there's a shutter through the building, you hear a truck go by and so forth. Um, in a way, you're doing with radio exactly what you do as a writer. I mean, you're finding ways to find equivalences. Because I think that when you hear those sounds, um, the, well, it's the first time in my life that I became aware, really, of the intensity and the quality of sound, because it, that's what you had to rely on to situate yourself. And that was your thread out of the labyrinth, in a sense. That was the way you learned about what other people were doing the quality also of what they were involved in, because you could sense, you could hear the quality of their voices change when they knew that they were going to be hanged in a week's time. It was definitely, you could hear when somebody sang that that person is going to die in a few days, as opposed to somebody else singing who probably still has two months or three months ahead of him. Um, and sometimes, um, if it was only one person due to be hanged, you would sing all by himself in the middle of the night, and then it would be very sad because it would be, you know, it would be much more of a melodic um, kind of a blues, still with religious um, connotations. Uh, but, you know, songs with words like, coming home, Lordy, coming home, uh, not much further to go, but it would be sung in a very sad, slow way. Uh, you can actually hear the quality of the listening of the other people. Because you know that everybody else in that prison is awake, lying there, listening to this guy. And everybody's giving him a chance to sing his song, as it were. You knew there's not be a single person who would be asleep then. You would actually hear people listening, lying with their ears close to the bars or to the walls. That was excerpted that that piece of the of the on, on this American life, and I was talking to Ira one Ira Glass one day, and he was saying that that is the great radio moment because you can hear everybody in America listening to him talking about hearing everybody in America listening, uh, 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 but 
anyway, uh, by the way, if you want to hear the whole piece, if you go to transom.org, which is the great place for avant-garde, uh, cutting-edge radio, uh, uh, they have a section, when you go there, of guests in which all these really amazing people have, Studs Terkel and Ira and other people are there for six weeks at a time and they do a thing. And I was there at one point and they put up all the radio pieces I've done. So if you go to, the, to my section on transom.org under the guests, you can hear that piece and some other pieces. But anyway, coming back to finishing the story. Um, so Yolanda devotes her life suddenly to this man she was going to divorce. But that is some of the deep background to the conversation we're about to have here at the end. Where we're, where we're listening to the different night birds and the owls and so forth. And evening was coming on, and Brayton and I were out back watching the setting sun blah on the surrounding hills. I heard a pair of mellow hoots off in the distance. Owls, I asked. No, Brayton said, smiling. Wood pigeons, probably. But we do have owls here, and crows, and quail, and nightingales. Well, we have everything. From there, he free associated to Pretoria and the birds that had sustained him in prison. That's one thing about spending a long stretch in prison, he commented. You never really get out afterwards. Part of you is continually being drawn back in. We were silent a few moments. The sun descended, the light deepened. I asked him whether he ever looked back cringingly on his behavior during those days. This is me being the friend of the homosexual. Come on, admit it. You feel horrible. You look terrible. You, you, you're a total asshole. Admit that you're a total asshole. Yeah. Oh, sure, he said. There are aspects of my behavior that still leave me appalled, but I also remember that that's what, that you're being continually programmed for that. You're being conditioned for self-destruction. They're letting you, lacing you with self-disgust. You're being made guilty. The whole process is a continual rape of one's own better instincts, so that sure it leaves its scar tissue thick across one's sense of self-worth. And yet, in a way, I have more confidence in myself than that. Damn it all, so I wasn't able to be perfect. Self-knowledge is not self-abasement or self-rejection. I was, I am a flawed human being. But that's more interesting than me, but that's more interesting than me in an iron cast. That's Sartre talking. I'm a human being, not a rock. And there's something to be said for fucking up. In fact, fucking up, if you aspire to be an artist, may be the great creative principle. Getting broken, broken wide open, and then delving among the shards, moving on. Painting, writing, these are always, first and foremost, struggles for authenticity. The sun had set and the world had suddenly gone quite dark. We went back inside. Some of his old galley show catalogs were strewn across the kitchen table, research for his forthcoming uh, South African exib exhibition. And one of them happened to be open to the family portrait. So, you know, we're coming from here back to here. Um, his triple self-portrait. I smiled, pointing to it. Ah, yes, Brayton concurred. We had a kid here the other day, and he was looking at that picture, and he asked me why the bird hand of the old man kept bothering the little boy. He laughed. I like that. I asked him how he himself felt about that picture nowadays. Oh, he said, you know how it is. That's me, dead at the age of nine. Me, dead at the age of 30. Me, dead at the age of 40 the rumble seat, the goldfish pond, the field plowed under. I have sympathy for all of them as I do for any dead, but they are not me. And what's funny about that ending, as far as I'm concerned, is there's part of you that just wants to say, oh, that's convenient. <laughs> I do all this work, oh, it's not me. But it's also true. But it's also convenient, but it's also true. But it's also convenient, it's also true. She's my daughter. She's my sister. She's my daughter. She's my sister. Uh, by the way, Roman Polanski is steeped in this world. Uh, uh, one of the things that Sartre writes about is the way that one of the exasperations of prison is that you can never punish the person who did the crime. You know, you sentence somebody to 30 years in prison, and the person who's there 30 years later it has nothing to do with the person who did the crime although he has everything to do with the person who did the crime, although he has nothing to do with the person who did the crime, and that's man who is that being who is not what he is and is what he is not. Um, so there is this part of that last sentence where he says, I have, I have sympathy for all of them as I do for any dead, but they're not me, which is totally exasperating and infuriatingly brayton. 
but it's also profoundly, profoundly true. And it's somewhere between uh, the impossible and the inevitable, which is to say it's just like life. Anyway, we'll stop there. Uh, I remind you about, well, next week we're going to be, we have one more meeting, and that's where we read, where we bring all this together in Joseph Mitchell's incomparable book, Chogul's Secret, which is for sale at Shakespeare and Company uh, uh, in, in his collection up in the old hotel. As I told you last time, uh, when we get to jo Joseph Mitchell, we're no longer doing literature, we're doing theology because there's no